Do you know how affordable it is to fly to Indonesia? $40 for a ticket to the international airport in Medan. $40 more and a five-hour drive to Bucket Lawang, and that's it. You're in the heart of Indonesia. At least you're in the area I think of when I think of Indonesia. In every direction, a sea of green. I always wanted to experience the rainforest firsthand. $100 earned me a two-day trek through the jungle with two experienced guides and all the sightings of wildlife that I could imagine. I hope when we first began our journey that I would see at least one Sumatran orangutan. They were the reason I came, honestly. Orangutans had always been my favorite animal, and I wanted to see one in person, in its natural habitat, before their critically endangered status became any bleaker. I donated where I could to help the conservation efforts, of course, but it's hard to feel like you're making a difference when you're only one person. Looking back, I wonder if I took the trip to Indonesia because I needed to rekindle my fighting spirit or because I had already given up on saving this species. It doesn't matter. In the end, neither the orangutans nor myself became the biggest part of my story. Although, I guess it did start with one orangutan in particular. We were only an hour into the first day's trek when the lead guide raised his flat palm toward me. I stopped immediately, and the second guide, who had been following in the rear, ran ahead to join him. They pointed to the trunk of a large tree, where the vines had wrapped a coil around it and formed a second shell. Whatever they were discussing, I couldn't see it. It was just a tree as far as I was concerned. Then they waved me forward. I approached slowly, exactly as they instructed, and soon my eyes landed on the object of their fascination. Around the rear side of the tree trunk, the layer of vines swelled out to create a hollow dome. Inside that dome, through the bar-like vines, I saw something large and hairy. The Sumatran orangutan. I think I yelped. I was so excited. The guides both glared at me until I quieted down. I hadn't realized it yet, but the orangutan at the base of the tree was frightened. It was hiding. Every few moments it would peek its head out from behind the vines and glance upward. We followed its vision to the canopy, but couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. No other primates, no predators. The orangutan was trembling. It didn't even notice that we were standing there. The guides ensured that we gave the animal plenty of space and we continued on our journey. I asked if that kind of encounter was odd. It felt odd. They didn't answer. We stayed silent for a long while after that, only chatting when the guides stopped to point out our first sighting of a particular plant or animal. It was all fascinating, all beautiful. But I couldn't shake the memory of the wide-eyed orangutan from my head. When the sun began to set, we heard the beast that had scared that poor orangutan. Far above us, something in the canopy howled. Now, I'm no expert, but in the time since this encounter, I've tried to identify that howl. The best way I can describe it is somewhere between a cry of a wolf and a chimpanzee. It was loud, high-pitched and long-winded. When the call finally faded, we all stood frozen in place. The guides didn't need to explain that they'd never heard anything like that. I could see it in their slack-jawed expressions. We watched the tops of the trees, searching for the shadows for the source of that strange howl. We didn't want to move and risk provoking the animal that we couldn't see. Then, something in those shadows moved. The entire canopy seemed to sway as the thing in the darkness shifted above us. Whatever it was, it was large enough to bend those trees without a grunt of effort. I remember asking if we should run. Instead of answering, one of the guides broke into a sprint. I followed him leaving the other one frozen in place. I like to think the guide we left behind got out of that jungle just fine. After all, the beast chased the two of us. Branches cracked and dropped from the sky, turning the dense tree limbs into a rain of foliage that fell at our heels as we ran. The creature was massive and powerful enough that it didn't need to be graceful. I tried to catch a glimpse of the animal when I could. Looking over my shoulder every dozen paces as I tried to keep up with the guide ahead of me, I saw these leathery red wings, the length of a car. I saw this long snout and pointed teeth, dark eyes the size of my clenched fists, and feet with these hook-shaped claws. I know that the two of us felt like the shadow of death was upon us. The creature felt inescapable, 
and the jungle felt like it would stretch on forever. But just as quickly as it came, the beast was gone. The only explanation, as far as I'm concerned, was that we had wandered into its territory. Maybe it had recently moved into a part of the forest and didn't want any intruders, human or orangutan. The guide refunded me and didn't say a word. I had questions that I didn't know how to ask. Instead of asking them, I just went home. The heart of Indonesia, I learned, was a dangerous place to be. I know answers aren't coming, not without going back. It's a cheap flight, remember? Tell me you want to see what I saw, and I'll take you to the place where I found death in the jungle. This happened a few years ago when I was still in high school. I'm in college now. We all decided to do what normal, bored, suburban high school kids do when we hear about a place that we aren't supposed to go to. We got wind of an abandoned psychiatric hospital a few cities over. Urban legend had said it was haunted and creepy. As you know, people had gone crazy exploring it. Naturally, myself and my three friends needed to check this place out. I mean, I didn't believe in all the rumors and whatnot, but then again, it'd be pretty great if something did happen. So we got our flashlights and a couple of cameras. We charged our phones and got our backpacks and got everything ready for the weekend to go check this place out. There were pictures online of the place, but they were all during the day. We needed to go at night, the middle of the night if we could. The pictures were pretty crazy. It was old, run down, but I needed to see it in person experience the place for myself. Apparently, the cops did monitor the place, so we had to be on the lookout for that too. I was not looking forward to being arrested or whatever. I don't need that in my life. We decided to go on a Sunday instead of a Saturday. Saturday is usually way more busy, you know? Whereas Sunday, people aren't out as much. At least, that's what we all decided. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Anyway, my friends came over and we piled into my car and left my house around 10 p.m. It took about 45 minutes to get to the city of Northville, another couple of minutes to get to the hospital. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty creepy, especially at night. And I'm not the type to get creeped out by anything. It was big and janky looking. Broken windows, boarded windows, overgrown grass. It was like out of a movie. I just kind of laughed when I saw it. We kept our flashlights off going up to the building. We hadn't seen any cops, but we weren't used to the area. We weren't really sure where they hung out. I mean, they have to drive by every so often, right? We found some broken windows to get into the place. It wasn't hard. I used the light on my phone and my two friends used flashlights. They tried to point them towards the ground so that the light wasn't too bright. My other friend held his cameras to take pictures and video of our exploration. Everything was dingy and dirty and the paint was peeling off the walls. A lot of the tiled floors were cracked and broken. Things would crunch under your feet when you walked in certain areas. There was furniture and all kinds of stuff left behind. We found a room with stacks of old paint cans, piled up almost to the ceiling. There were old cafeteria tables folded up, tables covered with old papers and plastic containers, a room filled with like a dozen fridges. It was really weird. Like, why would you just leave all this stuff for years? There's like graffiti everywhere on the walls, like all over the place. We took a bunch of pictures of it. There was one room that had, you're not getting out alive, painted in red on the walls. That kind of freaked us out, and we just kind of laughed it off. There was one area, though, that had, I love you, on a brick wall, and that's when stuff started to get kind of weird. We're standing there taking a picture of the wall when we swear we hear footsteps down the hall. We just stop and look at each other, and my friend Steph gets all wide-eyed. I'm trying not to laugh, and my other friends are shushing me. So I go and I look down the hallway, and I can't see anything. I mean, it's a super old building. It could be anything. And with the graffiti on the walls, people obviously come here from time to time. So we keep going. We find a couple of rooms with broken glass all over the floor and some abandoned wheelchairs and old bed frames. We come across one room with a metal table in the middle of the room, with cabinets lining the walls. There's like holes in the table and a rubber hose attached to it. I don't know what the hell this was used for, but 
We take some pictures of it, and we hear the footsteps again. We look at each other, and I swear I heard some whistling. I go and stick my head out the door and look around. I don't see anything, and now I don't hear anything. My friends started to get kind of panicky at this point, so we walk out into the hall, and then we hear something, creaking, like a door or a window. That made my buddy Rob jump, and I almost bust out laughing. He stops, though, and stares into his camera, and points at the screen on it. We all crowd around him, and see this shadow, like, moving down the hall. I shine the flashlight down the hall, and there's nothing. I look back at the screen, and it seems like the shadow is still moving down the wall of the hallway. Well, that was it. That sent my friends into full freakout mode, and they take off down the hallway. I go running after them, and we hear like loud crashing behind us, like things are either being flung around or smashed into each other. I don't really know. We find a room with smashed out windows, and we head outside. We were all freaked out and turned around, so it took a second to figure out which way the car was. But we ran the entire way. That shadow was shaped like a man with a long coat, I think. Some of my other friends thought it was a lady with a dress on. I really don't know, but it was definitely a crazy night. And none of my friends ever want to do anything like it ever again. It was Christmas Eve and I was running late to dinner at my parents' house. It was my first year working in retail over the holidays. And everyone and their extended families were buying last-minute gifts. I didn't expect my shift to run that far over. No rest for the wicked, I guess. My family usually gets cheap Chinese takeout for Christmas Eve. Not very exciting, I know, but I was looking forward to it regardless. I had planned to have at least an hour to go home, take a shower and make myself look presentable, but I would have to leave right from work if I wanted to make it to the party at all. It started snowing the last hour of my shift. Not enough to stick to the roads, but enough to make things pretty slippery. Great, I thought. That's just what I need. As if I wasn't already late. The drive to my parents would take about 40 minutes, but it likely would be an hour with the snow. I closed the store with another co-worker and got my car. The snow was falling in big flakes now. The parking lot was a little slippery driving, but the streets had been salted. Maybe I wouldn't be as late as I had thought. I soon left the city streets and headed towards the dark country roads. My parents didn't live in the middle of nowhere or anything, but I had to drive through a couple of towns to get there, mostly on state highways surrounded by farmland. The snow was falling heavily by now, and visibility wasn't great. I remember snow sticking to my windshield wipers and freezing, so much so that I had to pull over and try to clean them off. I wasn't quite sure where I was. The visibility was pretty bad. It looked like I was near the game farm, but I couldn't tell for certain. The game farm is a big waterfowl area, super swampy and marshy. In the winter, it looks just like a normal field except for the barren, swamp trees scattered throughout. I squinted through the snow to see if I could make out if those were swamp trees or not. If they were, then I was only about 10 miles away from my parents' house. As I was looking out at those trees, I thought I saw lights glowing from the other side of the road. They were small, sort of a reddish yellow, just the two lights. I held my hand up to block the snow and to see if I could get a better look. By this point, I had recognized the game farm, but I couldn't see what these lights were. There was no way a person could be walking around out there. This was our first big snowfall of the season, and it hadn't been cold enough for the ground to freeze. Anybody out there would have fallen right into the swamp. The lights looked like they were moving closer to the road, but with the snow, I can't really say for sure. But that's what they looked like. I stood outside my car and watched them, trying to figure out what they could be. They went out once and then came back a second later, then twice, then three times. And then I realized they were eyes. The lights going out, whatever it was, was blinking. I jumped back in my car and locked the door. I watched it for a moment. I knew I should drive away, but I desperately wanted to see what it was. The eyes stopped moving towards me, but they stayed fixated on my car. I drove away, and whatever it was didn't try to follow me. I had all but forgotten how late I was to Christmas Eve dinner. The only thing I saw was its eyes. I didn't even see a shape of an outline or its body. 
I can say that it looked to be around my height, about five and a half feet tall. The snow was still falling steadily, and while I was driving slowly, I was confident that I left the creature with the glowing eyes far behind me. But I didn't even make it a half mile before something ran into the front of my car. I didn't hit the brakes because I didn't want to slide off the road. It looked big, maybe a deer. I didn't hit it, but I saw something move in the ditch on the other side of the road. I pulled over, but I didn't want to get out of the car after the incident at the game farm. So I just watched in my side mirror to see if anything in the ditch moved. It was hard to see through the snow, but it looked like this creature was getting up. It stood up on two legs, and for a split second, I thought I had just almost hit a person on the road. But then, I saw its eyes. Those same reddish-yellowish eyes from the swamp. There must be two of them, because there's no way that one could have gotten here so fast. I was driving slow, but I was still going at least 45 miles per hour. But as soon as it stood up and shook off the snow, I realized how it could have gotten here so fast and how it ran right in front of my car without getting hit. It had wings, like bird wings. I don't know. It was hard to see in the snow, but but it for sure had wings. It was too dark to see its face, but I saw its eyes and its wings. I drove dangerously fast the rest of the way to my parents' house. I'm surprised I even made it. And thankfully, this creature didn't follow me again. I don't have any other explanation for it. And I haven't ever seen it again since that night on Christmas Eve. I live alone on a ranch I inherited from my mother. I don't do any of the ranch work myself. I lease most of the land out to a cattle rancher, but I have kept a small area for my horses and goats. This originally happened not long after I moved to the ranch. My mother had been feeding some stray cats that took up residency in the barn I now use for my horses. I think there were six or seven cats in total. My mother had what we thought was a form of dementia, but after what I've experienced out here on the ranch, I'm not quite sure what to believe. She used to tell me little things here and there that made absolutely no sense, but somehow she seemed to know the end was coming. Her last note to me was about the cats, of all things. It was strange, almost laughable. The note said to keep the cat bowl full, always, it's easier that way. I didn't think much of it at the time. I was dealing with a lot of other things, but I did as she requested. I kept the cat bowl in the barn filled to the top. It was absurd to me how much cat food they went through in a week. I was convinced there were other animals coming to eat this food because there was just no way these little cats could clean out the entire bowl overnight. I remember my mother having problems with the cat food situation in the past. She would find it broken into more often than not and had to keep the food in a locked box. None of this is too surprising when you live on a ranch. There are loads of wild animals that would jump at the chance to get an easy meal. Thinking back to the note, she probably just decided it was easier to feed the wildlife than to fight it. I knew feeding the wildlife came with all sorts of problems. So I decided to change things up with the cats. I began feeding them all individually, morning and night. This went on for maybe a week before I started having problems. At first, it was just little things. Random things in the barn would be moved around. But then things begin escalating. I would find planks of wood torn off the barn and scattered outside. And then the fences started getting torn down. It wasn't until I went to the barn one day and found the calf food box had been destroyed that I finally put two and two together. I thought I was dealing with a bear. I removed every trace of food from the barn and set up a portable electric fence around the door that had been broken in. The bear, or what I thought was a bear, didn't like that. It tore down the electric fence and then damaged the barn again the following night. Now, I knew a little bit about bear management from a summer job I had at a local state park. We would harass any bears that came into the campsite with bear bangers and bean bag rounds. They learned quickly to stay well away from people. So 
That was my plan. I didn't want to kill this bear, but I wanted it to stay out of my bar. So I planned to sit outside one night and wait for this thing to show up looking for food and then blast it with a few beanbag rounds. It might have been easier for my mom just to feed the animal, but I wanted to put an end to this. I waited up for it until 1 a.m. I was sitting inside the barn, waiting for this bear to come waltzing through the door. But when the door creaked open, there was no bear standing there. Upon first glance, I thought it was a man. I told him to stop in his tracks. He must have heard me because he did. I shined my flashlight on him and I'm surprised I didn't faint right there. The creature looked half man, half ape. If Bigfoot was real, this might have been him. He stood on two legs like a human. He had dark brown fur covering most of his body. His face, his hands, and his feet were hairless but had thick skin like a gorilla. His eyes were the worst part. They looked almost completely human. It was disturbing to see human eyes on a face like that. I had my gun pointed straight at him. I yelled at him to leave and he started to back away. I don't know if he could understand me or if it was the tone of my voice that keyed him in that he wasn't welcome here. One of the barn cats approached him before he backed out of the door. The cat obviously knew the creature and had favorable experiences with it. The creature bent over slowly to pet the cat before walking the rest of the way out. Now, I know I'm going to sound crazy here, but it was at this point that I realized he didn't want to harm anyone. None of the damage to the barn caused anyone harm. He could have hurt one of the cats or goats or horses, but he didn't. He was just searching for food. How? He probably could have eaten one of those cats if he wanted to, but he didn't. I wondered how long my mother had been feeding this creature for and what type of interactions she had had with it. I never saw the creature up close again, but I did put the cat food bowl back out. Sometimes I would see a shadow out by the barn, but that was it. I think he realized that I was okay with him being around, but I didn't want to see him. I know this sounds like a crazy story. I swear it's true. There are a lot of people who live near the wilderness areas that know about creatures like this, and we just learned to live alongside them. I don't know what became of the creature I saw. He only stuck around for a couple of years after I moved to the ranch. I assumed he must have either moved on or died. I was working as a ranger in the East Yellowstone area. I was sent out to investigate a fire violation in the back country. We were in a severe drought at the time, and the fire danger was extremely high to what was a case that needed to be taken seriously. It was reported by a backpacking group. They said it didn't look like a campfire. It looked like something that was burning on a raised platform, like a funeral pyre or something. One of the hikers said that they saw people around the fire, but that all the people had fled the moment they came into view. They were afraid to approach the fire in fear of conflict with whatever people were there, which was a fair assessment on their part. You never know what you're going to find out here, and half of the people hiking here carry guns for bear defense. I have learned some strange reports over the years, but this one had to be the strangest. So, I don't fault these hikers for not approaching and attempting to put out the fire. My first concern was the fire. If that caught the wind and spread, we could lose hundreds or even thousands of anchors of forest in conditions like this. Luckily, the hikers had a GPS with them and recorded the exact location of the fire. I called in a chopper to do a flyover of the location and see if anything was spreading or in danger of spreading. Luckily, the pilot reported there appeared to be no signs of an active fire. Not so lucky that I had to hike in to investigate the situation. And, of course, the only way to that location was by foot. Not even an ATV could make it. I'll spare you the details of my long, grueling hike. 
I finally reached the location on the GPS. It was a clearing near a small alpine lake. There was a forest backed up to the lake on one side and a valley on the other. I immediately found the remains of the fire. It was just like the backpackers described it. There was a wooden platform about six feet long and three feet wide raised up off of the ground. It was burnt black and much of the structure had collapsed from the fire. I examined the area, trying to figure out what was going on here. It definitely wasn't a campfire or anything like it. One of the hikers said it looked like a funeral pyre and I had to agree with him. I searched the ashes, trying to figure out what exactly was burned on this platform, but I couldn't find anything. I found a couple of stone fragments in amongst the ashes. There were what looked like human tracks in the dirt, bare feet, no shoes. Someone else had been here digging through this before me. My first thought was maybe this was some native ritual, but then I looked up, staring at me. From the edge of the forest were three people. Well, I'll call them people because I don't know how else to describe them. They were all short, no more than five feet tall. At first glance, I thought they were wearing fur coats, an odd choice in the middle of the summer. But then I looked closer. The best way I can describe them is some sort of cross between a man and an ape. I've heard stories of Bigfoot, and I don't think that's what these things were. They were too small and their body hair was too sparse. All three of them had sort of tannish brown hair all over their bodies. Their faces and necks were hairless, along with their hands and feet. None of them were wearing clothes, nor did they have any provisions with them. They look like monkey people. I know it sounds crazy, but that's the best way I can describe them. They let me watch them for a while. I was still kneeling over the burnt remains of the wooden platform. I was afraid to stand up, in fear of how they might react. They all just stood there looking at me, until one of them grunted. It was a deep, guttural sound. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I thought my best course of action was to back away slowly. The only form of protection I had with me was a can of bear spray and I wasn't sure it would stop these guys if they decided to attack me. I was backing away from them when one of them picked up a rock and threw it in my direction. I knew they wanted me to leave, and I wasn't going to argue with them. They waited for me to get a fair distance away from them before they approached the platform and started dismantling it. I never believed in this type of thing before, before I saw those creatures in the valley I always thought, if there was some unidentified species living among us, that we would have found evidence of them by now. But these things were smart. I think the hiker was right about the funeral pyre. I think they were likely burning their dead and hadn't finished cleaning up when I arrived. If I had showed up even an hour later, I bet there would have been nothing there at all. I don't think they're aggressive towards humans. They let me leave and didn't attack me, but they definitely didn't want anything to do with me either. The area I had to hike was incredibly remote. Most backpackers don't head out that far. I don't know how big their population is, and honestly, I don't know if we'll ever find out. I grew up in the desert. There's a lot of strange stuff that happens out here that nobody likes to talk about. I had heard stories all throughout my life, but they were only whispers. Like I said, people out here don't like to talk about that stuff. I didn't have my own encounter until I was 27 years old. I was working on a road construction crew. We would do road work at night. It got too hot during the day. Plus. There was less traffic overnight, which meant less danger for us, or so we thought. This particular project was in a rural area leading to a reservation. There was a dispute over who was responsible for the road, 
they ended up deciding the city would repair it. The road itself was in rough shape and responsible for more than a few flat tires, judging by the look of things. I'll admit, it was a creepy area, especially at night, but I honestly didn't expect to find anything supernatural out here. At first, we would see shadows moving past the floodlights. I didn't think much of it the first time it happened, but then it would happen again, and again. Our first thought was a problem with the lights themselves, but upon inspection, we couldn't find anything wrong. The shadows kept happening. In fact, they were increasing. Myself and the rest of the crew thought it must be some desperate animal looking for food. Road construction is a loud, busy environment. Even at night, if it was an animal, it was probably starving. I couldn't think of any other reason that would make a wild animal invade a construction zone. I know it didn't make much sense, but it was the only explanation I could come up with. Then one night, something broke into my truck. The entire cab was torn apart, including the seats. I had been in my truck maybe 30 minutes prior, so whatever did it couldn't have been far away. I turned the lights toward the land surrounding the road, but I couldn't see anything out there. The next night, someone had a tire torn completely off of their truck, and I mean torn off. The tire wasn't removed by a person. It was ripped off by the axle. We heard the truck tip over when the tire was ripped off and ran over to it. Every one of us grabbed a light and looked around for whatever caused the damage. I didn't see anything at all out there in the desert, but then my flashlight reflected two eyes staring at me from behind some sparse brush. It was a coyote. I breathed a sigh of relief. There was no way a coyote was out here ripping the tires off of trucks. It was like the coyote heard my thoughts. It crept out from behind the brush and walked toward me. I yelled at it to try to scare it away, but it just kept walking. I really don't know how to say this next part without sounding crazy, but then I heard a voice speak to me inside my head. The coyote locked eyes with me. Its mouth didn't move, but I heard its voice. It told me to leave that things weren't safe for us right now. I yelled at the animal again and told it to get out of here, but it didn't budge. I picked up a handful of pebbles off the ground and threw them at the coyote. It dodged them, but then it sat down and faced me again. I heard the voice speak again. It asked me if my job was worth my life. I don't know why I responded but I did. I asked the beast to show itself how it really was. I knew it wasn't a coyote. It was something else. The coyote looked at me and smiled. It was a wicked smile. Its mouth grew too big for its face. The voice simply said it wasn't safe for us to be out here. Come back in the spring to finish the road if you must things should be settled by then. Now, I don't consider myself a superstitious person, but I told the crew to pack up and that we were pulling out. I got a ton of shit from my supervisor, but I finally convinced them to revisit the project in the spring, and we did. We went back in the spring and fixed the road. We didn't have any problems that time. No shadows, no damage to our equipment, and best of all, no demon coyotes. I still don't know what that thing was, if it was good or evil, or why it was warning me to leave. I think about it from time to time, wondering if it was trying to keep us from harm, or it was trying to keep us out of whatever evil business it was up to. I don't have any answers for that, but I did finally realize why people around here don't like to talk about these things. They sound unbelievable, 
They make you sound crazy when you talk about them. I know what I saw, and I know what I saw was real. That's all I can say about it. I know other people out here have had similar experiences. They're just too afraid to talk about them. I used to do information technology work for a company that dealt with chemicals. The place has since been shut down, but I worked there for about four years. I would fix technical problems and make sure all the technology in the place was running smoothly. I installed a 24 camera security system that covered every bit of the inside and outside of the facility. When installing it, I was specifically instructed to put the cameras in the test facility on a different loop, so the rest of the employees, including myself, didn't have access to the feed. They also wanted me to put the computers in there on a different network as well. Anytime there would be technical problems anywhere else, it was easy to deal with. Anytime there was a problem in the testing site, however, it was incredibly annoying. I would have to have a guard and one of the executives with me monitoring everything I did. They would also restrict my access to the exact area that the tech problem was and used thick black sheets to cover up everything else. It made every simple fix take several days longer than it needed to. One time, I was working on one of the computers on the testing site and they forgot to give me access to the light switch. I asked for access and finally just ended up fixing the problem with a flashlight. It was ridiculous, but they were very careful about revealing anything that happened in that area. One day, I was talking with some of the workers when we heard several screams come from the testing site. I checked the security monitors to figure out where it came from, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Of course, we didn't have eyes on the testing site, so I got on the radio and asked if everyone was okay. All the workers were fine but everyone on the testing site was on a different radio signal. It was a breach of protocol, but we all went to the testing site doors, pounded on the doors, and asked if everyone was okay. There were faint sounds of people scurrying around on the other side, but nobody responded to us. Suddenly, about 10 men with rifles and hazmat suits came in and ordered everyone out of the facility. We all waited in the parking lot for about an hour, and a man in a suit pulled up and told us all to go home for the day. The next day, I was about to leave for work when I got a call that the facility was shut down for a week and that I would be paid for the week off. I asked if everyone was okay, and they said they weren't at liberty to disclose any information and they would let me know when to come back to work. I got in my car and drove by the facility, and the gates were closed. A couple of days later, I got a call that the facility was shut down and I'd be receiving a severance package. I parked by a gas station that was close to the facility to see if I could see anything. There was no movement for a while, and I was about to get out of there when suddenly I see the gates open and three black vans pull in. They drive straight up to the entrance and open their back doors. The men in hazmat suits start loading huge black bags into the back of the vans. Each bag took two men to load in the vans. I was horrified. Were these body bags? Did those people at the testing site die? I tried to rationalize it and convince myself I was being paranoid. They had to just be getting the last pieces of trash out of there. But if that was the case, wouldn't they just put everything in the dumpster out back? Something bizarre and possibly illegal was going on here. I got the hell out of there. I didn't want to be seen witnessing this and end up in the back of one of those vans. Later that night, I was scrolling through Facebook that the building had burned down. The report said it appeared to be due to faulty wiring. I couldn't believe it. I had to see it for myself. I drove by and, sure enough, the police and fire department had closed the road down and you could still see the smoke billowing out of the remains of the building. 
I've since moved on with my life. I moved to Wisconsin, got a new job, and I have a beautiful spouse and family now. This experience has made me untrusting of people and has given me a passionate hatred of things done in secret. I realized that you could be completely innocent and have the best of intentions in the world and still end up in a body bag due to other people's sketchy behavior. Perhaps I could have saved everybody's lives if I had access to the security feed. This weighs heavily on me, but not knowing exactly what happened is even worse. Was it an accident that killed everyone in the testing site, or was it even more sinister? Were those people's deaths intentional? What kind of tests were they running in there, and why was it all top secret? And most importantly, why did they burn the building down? What didn't they want anyone to find in there? Actually, I don't know what it is. I mean, I really don't know what I saw, but I'm convinced it's something that the government doesn't want us to know about. I'm sure of that. I work on an oil rig, drilling wells out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a good setup, mostly. We do two weeks on, two weeks off, and the pay is higher than most jobs on land here in South Louisiana. The rig I work on is big, and I'm part of a crew of almost 100 people. We'll work around 12 hours a day while we're on our two-week hitch. We're just off the coast near Venice, Louisiana. When we're off duty, there's a gin, a theater room, and a few pool tables. Lots of the guys are into fishing, and they do that when they're not working. I never got into it until I got on the rig, but I let my buddy Jackson hook me up. He's got all the gear. Depending on what shift we were on, we might be out there early in the morning or late at night, just waiting for those fish to bite. If we got a good tuna or something, we'd get the rig cooked to fillet and cook it. Anyway, fishing is a lot of staring out into the ocean. There's not much to see out there, so if there's anything, you notice it. One day we were sitting out there and saw a ship. Not a big deal normally. Ships come and go, but they're usually pretty far away. But this one was close enough, though, that I could see the flag it was flying. Looked to me a lot like Old Glory, so I figured it was U.S. Navy. The weird part was that the ship hung around for a while. They don't usually do that, at least that I've ever noticed. I asked Jackson, and he said no. It wasn't really normal for one to hang around near a rig, especially not a Navy ship. We do get ships out there, of course hauling oil or doing other jobs for the oil business. Neither of us could figure out what this Navy ship was doing, though. We saw it a couple more times on that hitch, just sort of hanging around, and I had a bad feeling about it, but wasn't sure why. I'd never had that feeling about a ship before. Something just seemed off. Next hitch, Jackson wasn't there. We'd gotten off each other's schedules. I'd been thinking about the ship, so I borrowed some binoculars from a friend who's into birding. I thought maybe I could see what was going on. Sure enough, while I was fishing one morning, I caught sight of that ship again, just stalling around near the rig. Not near enough so I could tell what was going on, though. I trained the binoculars on it, and it took me a while, but I finally located some activity. Off one side, I could see some people heaving something to the edge of the ship. It was hard to see what it was, really. I trained the binoculars on it, and it looked like a big box. They shoved it over the side, and it sunk right away from what I could see. After that, the ship turned and slowly glided away. I watched for the next few mornings, and each time, the ship came, dropped something in the water, and left. Everything they dumped looked similar, like huge boxes, maybe the size of a compact car. I was curious so I asked around on the rig and no one knew anything about the ship, or they didn't want to say. I felt like a couple of people acted nervous, like maybe they did know something, but didn't want to open their mouths about it. During the next two-week hitch, I was at it again with the binoculars, and this time Jackson was back with me. We were on the day shift and started fishing in the evening. I saw the ship come near sunset, and we traded the binoculars back and forth. 
We couldn't see any activity this time, or at least not with people tossing things overboard. We saw some people moving around the deck, and I was curious and wanted to know why the ship would be just sitting there. On the second evening, though, things started to heat up. At least that was my impression. A lot of people, maybe 20 or 30, crowded on deck. They had a bunch of big black bags that they were hauling around like they were heavy. Two people had to carry each one. I asked Jackson what he thought they were, and he said, body bags. I took the binoculars back, and that was what they looked like. There were a lot, maybe a hundred. Why would the Navy be hauling around a hundred body bags? I asked him. Neither of us could guess. I mean, wouldn't we have heard it on the news if that many Navy guys died? It was weird. We decided to try to track the ship, find out what it was and why it was there. I'd written down the dates and times when I'd seen it, but when we checked the ship tracking websites, it didn't show any ship being there at those times. Once we'd figure out how to track ships, we used our last few days on the hitch to watch for it any time we could. We saw it one more time, but it didn't show up on the tracking site. Also, that time, we didn't see it dump anything. We also borrowed a shortwave radio and searched for messages coming from the ship, but there was nothing. No matter what we tried, we could find no concrete evidence that it existed. Like it wasn't even there. Except that we could see it. I'm convinced someone was hiding that ship. They didn't want anyone to know it had been there. And whatever it was dumping was something they wanted to hide too. I wish I had gotten a better look at it. Next time I go out, if I'm on that same rig, I'll look for it again and let you know. I was driving home from work. I live about 45 minutes from work and I work pretty much every day. I take the drive so often that I usually just kind of zone out on the way home and listen to music. I was tired and I'm ashamed to say I fell asleep behind the wheel. The next thing I know, I wake up and I've crashed head first into a tree. The airbags went off and the car was smoking, but I wasn't seriously hurt, thank God. I do still have whiplash and my back hurts, but it could have been much worse. I'm seriously grateful that I didn't hit another car or a person walking on the side of the road. I immediately called my wife and let her know I was in an accident and I was okay but needed to call the police and my insurance. I got off the phone and got out of the car and looked around. My car is totaled, but had the tree not been there, I would have gone much farther down a hill and possibly been killed. I called 911 and gave them my approximate location as accurately as I could. They said since I blacked out, I could have head trauma and should go to the hospital. I don't have any health insurance, so I was pissed, but as per protocol, they sent an ambulance. Better safe than sorry. Anyway, I was just walking around trying to catch my breath, and I saw something close to my car. I thought it was a deer at first due to the huge antlers on its head. The closer I got to it, I realized this creature was not a deer. This thing towered over my car on its hind legs. It had to be like eight feet tall. It had huge muscles, red eyes, giant antlers, gray skin, and long black hair. It looked right at me and just stood there. I was in shock. It let out this huge shriek that was the most appalling thing I'd ever heard in my life. It sounded like a wounded animal crying out but more aggressive and like nothing I'd ever heard before. The police came and the sirens and lights must have scared it off. It ran off into the woods shrieking and I ran over to the police officer. When I explained what I just saw, he told me to sit down and that I was in shock. He said there was nothing out there to get me and I needed to calm down and breathe. I kept insisting that the creature was just here, but he just kept trying to calm me down. When the ambulance came, I tried to explain to the paramedics what I saw, but they kept saying I most likely had head trauma from the accident and I was just hallucinating. I was seriously pissed off. 
When I arrived at the emergency room, I tried to explain to anyone that would listen what just happened, but they all kept saying the same thing. They told me to calm down. I was probably experiencing head trauma and I was hallucinating. I got an MRI on my head and the doctors determined that I had suffered a mild concussion and would most likely experience whiplash. I asked if I hallucinated at the scene of the accident, why wasn't I hallucinating now? They just kept insisting that I needed to calm down, which kept making me angrier and angrier. My family got there and I tried to explain to them what happened. I told them about the antlers, the huge body, the long hair, the red eyes, the awful shrieking noises. Then they, my own family, told me I hallucinated as a result of the head trauma. I just needed to calm down and take it easy. I know my family wanted the best for me and just wanted me to get well, but my own flesh and blood not believing me felt awful. I felt lost when I got home. I called my friends to let them know what happened. All of them told me that I probably just hallucinated as a result of hitting my head and I needed to relax and let it go. I debated filing a police report, but I already knew what they were going to say to me. I've been feeling so lost since this happened. I called my work and told them I was in an accident and needed to take the rest of the week off. I told my boss about the creature I saw and he told me it sounded like a creature called Wendigo. He was the first person to believe me, and he claimed that his wife saw a Wendigo in the middle of the woods when on a camping trip. It was so validating, and even though it was such a horrid-looking creature, the fact that somebody else saw it made me feel some relief. My boss's wife and I are planning on getting together at some point to discuss our experiences with the creature that very well could have been a Wendigo. If anybody else out there has had a similar experience, please let me know. I would love to talk about this further. The fact that so many people don't believe me, especially the people closest to me, is very difficult to bear. I haven't questioned my sanity at any point during all of this, but if everybody in my life thought I was crazy, that might eventually weigh heavily on me. It's good to know I'm not alone going through all of this. I have an experience from when I was working a summer job at a state park. I don't know if I should even be talking about this or not, but I think people deserve to know what is out there. I was working in a state park in northern Idaho. It was mostly an office job. Sometimes I got to work outside, but not very often. Most of it was boring stuff like selling park passes and making camping reservations. I worked in a little building at the park entrance where cars would drive up to the window. There were offices for two park rangers in the back, but I never really went in there. Everything I needed was up front at my workstation. Everything was pretty routine in the months leading up to my experience. Like I said, it wasn't a difficult job. Sometimes we would get insanely busy, but in between the rushes, I would have a lot of time to myself. The rangers really didn't care what I did in the slow times. As long as I was available to help park guests as soon as someone showed up, Oftentimes, I spent my free time drawing. This is relevant later. We had gotten a couple of phone calls about wolves in the area. I didn't think it was that abnormal. Given the part of country we were in, I was given instruction to transfer any calls regarding wolves to the rangers. I was just a college kid trying to make money, so I didn't question it. Not to say I didn't like the job, but I just wasn't invested in the wolf issue. Then one day a park guest comes to the office looking for one of the rangers. They claim that a gigantic wolf with human hands had tried to break into their tent the previous night. They said the wolf went on both two legs and four, like it was both man and beast. It was probably the strangest conversation I had ever had before in my life. He waited in the lobby for one of the rangers to return. He started telling his story. 
and the ranger pulled them into his office. It was definitely weird, but I wasn't too concerned at the time. I assumed he probably took something the night before and was seeing things. That or some weirdo tried to break into his tent. I was always taught that a man was the most dangerous creature you could run into in the wild. Even bears tend to steer clear of humans for the most part. Anyway, it was maybe two weeks after that incident. I was working in the office during one of our slow times. Like I said before, I usually entertain myself by drawing. The problem that day was that I had run out of paper. I looked under the desk and the paper was out there too. I knew the rangers both had printers in their offices. So I decided to sneak into one and grab a couple of sheets. It was completely innocent. I wasn't looking for anything, just a sheet of paper to stave off my boredom. I passed by the ranger's desk to reach the printer when I saw a manila envelope laying there, labeled Creature. Curiosity got the best of me, and I looked inside. There were multiple reports of this wolf man, and a map documenting locations and dates of the encounters. They were all over the area, including several places in the park that I worked, and there were photos too. Most of the photos were of damaged property, like tents and RV campers being torn apart. There was this one photo of a hard-sided RV that was nearly torn to shreds. It looked like something you'd see from an angry grizzly, but there were photos of the tracks too, and the tracks were definitely not bear tracks. They looked like wolf tracks, just bigger. I dug through the photos in the envelope until I came to one that showed the creature in its entirety. It was just like that man had said. It looked like a cross between a man and a wolf. The photo wasn't super high quality. It looked like it had been taken from a decent distance away, but you could see the creature well enough to tell that it wasn't some sort of normal wolf or bear. Maybe it was a person in a costume. I don't know. I never saw the creature myself. I went out to grab my phone and take a photo of it, but the ranger walked through the door. I knew the only person that could answer my questions was right there, but I dared not say anything. What I saw in that envelope was unnerving. I did my best to just go back to work, like nothing happened. Less than a week later, I was scheduled to work five days in a row, but one of the rangers told me to take the next two days off. I thought for sure they found out I had looked in the envelope. At that point, I wasn't just afraid of getting fired. I was afraid of getting in trouble with the government or something. That is, until I caught up with some of my coworkers. They were also told to take those days off. From the sounds of it, the park would have no staff for two days. At this point, I knew there was something going on or something they were trying to cover up. I drove past the park on my day off and in front of the entrance had barricades across it. I could see the outlines of vehicles in the parking lot. They looked like military vehicles to me, but I'm not super well versed in that kind of stuff. Whoever they were, I knew they were out there hunting the wolf creature. We all came back to work like nothing happened. The reports of the wolves had stopped. I did manage to get a chance to sneak into the ranger's office a couple of times, but I couldn't find the envelope anywhere. I wish I had more answers, but I never did find out anything more about it. I was driving through the woods of northern Minnesota to a cabin I had rented for the week. I am an amateur painter and I was looking forward to having some time to myself to work on a few projects. I was not at all prepared for what I found when I got there. I saw something odd on the drive-in, but didn't think much of it. At first, I thought it was a moose, crashing through the undergrowth with its antlers. I was terrified, even from the safety of my car. I pulled over to see what it was. The creature wasn't too far from the road, but it was summer and the foliage was so thick, I didn't get a very good look. 
Whatever it was, it was making quite a ruckus in the woods. I saw the outline of its back, but that was about it, and as soon as I realized it was roughly the height of a moose, I immediately got back onto the road and continued my drive. I had heard stories of moose attacking vehicles for no apparent reason, and I didn't want to find out if they were true or not. The cabin was roughly six miles from the spot on the road where I saw what I thought was a moose. I'm not a big outdoors person. I didn't plan to venture too far away from my cabin. I figured I would spend some time outside painting the landscape, but that was about it. And seeing the moose on the drive made me a little extra cautious. The cabin was quiet when I arrived, but I hadn't expected anything less. Considering how deep in the forest I was, I didn't notice anything strange until later that night. The first sign was the smell. It was a faint smell. I couldn't pinpoint its location. It seemed to be constantly changing. It was an organic, rotting smell like spoiled meat. I searched the cabin for anything that could be causing it. I checked the refrigerator, the freezer, the pantry, but I couldn't find anything. What was strange about it is that it only showed up at night. This happened the next three nights. I would notice the smell just after sundown and it would linger around the property throughout the night. By morning, it was gone. I ended up calling the owner of the cabin and expressed my concern about the smell, thinking it was maybe a gas leak. They sent out a company that day to check the gas lines, but everything was fine. No one had any idea what would even cause the smell that only appeared at night. I should have taken that as a sign to leave the cabin, but I had already paid for the week, so against my better judgment, I stayed. On the fourth night, the smell appeared much stronger than it had previously. It was about 2 a.m. in the morning and it was so bad that it woke me up and I felt like I could barely breathe. I went into the kitchen to get some water. I was actually coughing, the smell was so bad. That's when I heard something moving outside. It sounded like it was just outside the kitchen window. I had the lights on, so whatever it was could definitely see me but I couldn't see it. I don't know exactly what it was, but something inside me just knew I had to turn off the light and I had to turn it off now. I tentatively approached the kitchen window to get a look at what was out there. I could see a shadow moving around, but that was it. It looked big. My mind immediately went to the moose I had seen on the drive in. It was about the right size to be a moose. I remembered there were outside lights on that side of the house. I made my way to the light switch and turned them on. The outside lights illuminated the area near the back of the house, and I finally saw the creature that had been stalking the property for the last four nights. It was no moose, although it was about the size of one. At first glance, it looked like an elk with longer hair. It was close enough to the window that I got a decent look at it. I could see that its hair was patchy and it was missing large sections of flesh across its body. I could see some of its rib bones and part of its pelvis was sticking out of its skin. It looked like a corpse, like some sort of zombie. I knew that this creature was the source of the rotten smell. The beast turned to look at me. I don't know if it could see me through the window or not, I still had the lights off inside, but the creature faced me like it could somehow see me. Its face was almost rotted away. I was certain I could see its skull behind the hide that was peeling off. I couldn't see any eyes. It was like there were just two black holes in its head. It watched the window for a moment, standing there, like it was frozen. I didn't know what to do, so I turned the outside lights off hoping that it would move on and leave me alone. I don't ever remember being that afraid in my life. I was desperately trying to be quiet, but I was sure this thing could probably hear my heartbeat through the walls, it was so loud. It was quiet out there for maybe five minutes, but then 
I heard the sound of hooves on the wooden steps outside the back door. I hid below the kitchen counter, hoping it couldn't see me from the window on the door. I don't know how long I waited down there. It must have been more than an hour. I hadn't heard anything moving outside, so I got up to check, desperately hoping it was gone. I look out the window, and I didn't see anything. I turned on the outside lights just to make sure. The sight that I saw at the window had haunted me for years. The creature was still standing there, looking in. Its face was only about six inches from the window. I couldn't stop myself. I screamed. The creature was taken aback by the noise and left the porch, but I don't think it went far. It wasn't until morning that the smell was gone. As soon as daylight hit, I had my things packed in the car and I drove out of there. I'm convinced that thing was haunting me. I don't have anyone else to tell this story to. My coworkers didn't believe me, but I swear this is true. I was working at a small family owned pizza shop. It was around 11 PM on a Friday night. I was alone in the shop waiting for the driver to come back from her last delivery so we could close the shop together. She texted me that she would be there in about 30 minutes. We always closed with two people, so I had to wait for her. I had all the doors locked and had a little bit of cleaning left to do that I could hopefully stretch out for the next half hour. I thought I heard someone pounding on the door, but when I looked, there was no one there. I went into the kitchen to prep for the crew tomorrow and I heard the pounding again. It was definitely coming from the front door. I headed out there to check it again and again, there was no one there. I figured someone was trying to be funny and I finally stopped checking after the third time it happened. But whoever was banging on the door obviously didn't like that. Because as soon as I went back into the kitchen, I heard someone tapping on the window. They obviously saw me through the window, going back and forth, checking the door. And when I went to the kitchen, they followed me and decided to harass me there. I was getting fed up with the situation. I opened the window and I was about to yell at whoever was out there playing this silly joke. There were four kids standing below the window. All of them were between 7 and 10 years old if I had to guess. It was dark outside so I couldn't get a good look at any of them. But they all appeared to be wearing Amish type clothing. We do have some Amish people that live on the outskirts of town, but that would be about 15 miles from here and I've never seen any Amish here at this time of night. The kids said that they were lost and asked if they could come in. Of course, I told them yes. I wasn't quite sure who to call about four lost Amish kids, but I wasn't going to leave them out there in the dark. I told them to meet me at the front and I would unlock the door. As I was walking to the door, I immediately realized something was wrong. I don't know what tipped me off. I just knew there was something off about these kids. They beat me to the door, which they shouldn't have due to the layout of the building. I should have reached the door much quicker than they did, even if they ran. I was just about to push the door open for them to come inside, but I just couldn't do it. It's like my body knew I was in danger and wouldn't let me open the door. I started asking them questions through the door. Their story was incredibly vague. I asked them where they were from and how they got there, but they just kept repeating that they were lost. I asked what far they were from and what their names were, but they wouldn't answer. They would say that it was cold outside and asked to come in. It was the dead of summer and was not cold outside in the slightest. I knew it was a script. I thought they were going to try and rob me of something. They kept their faces and eyes down, so I couldn't get a good look at them. I thought it was because they didn't want me to recognize them if they were indeed up to no good. But that wasn't it at all. I finally told them that I didn't think it was a good idea to let them in, but I would call a police officer to drive them home. 
They asked if they could wait inside for the police officer. I was now certain that this was some sort of attempted robbery, and I wasn't going to get robbed by a bunch of kids, so I told them to wait on the sidewalk. The oldest kid got agitated at my response and began banging on the door. That's when he looked up at me, and I finally saw his face. He was ghostly pale, but that wasn't the strange part. It was his eyes. They were completely black. All of their eyes were black. He looked at me and said, it would have been easier if you just let us in. But it wasn't a child's voice that came out of his mouth. He sounded like some sort of demon. I was terrified. I ran back to the kitchen to grab my phone to call the police. The kids were already at the window when I got there. There was no way they could have made it there before me. No way. Of course, the kids had vanished before the police arrived. The police decided it was likely an elaborate prank just meant to scare me. But I knew there was something else going on. Those weren't kids. I don't know what they were, but they definitely weren't human. It's hard to explain. If you ever run into them, and you better hope you don't, you'll know. It's that sixth sense that people have that warns them about danger. That's what I felt. I don't know what would have happened if I let them in, and I don't ever want to find out.